Today is a video review of a lesser known work by Sir Walter Scott, Old Mortality. And I know I just started this video uh, the same way I tell you never to start an essay by telling you what it's to be about, but yeah, whatever. Um, usually when people think of Sir Walter Scott, they think of Ivanhoe, which is worth reading, or Rob Roy, which was uh, made into a terrible movie that did not do the book justice at all. It had the title in common with the book and nothing else. Uh, the, I may get off on sidetrack, but the protagonist in the book of Rob Roy is not Rob Roy. And um, he never shows up in the movie. Uh, the main bad guy in the book never shows up in the movie. Uh, it was a terrible movie. And um, I know some people like it, and I admit it had good actors, and it had a good setting, but it's still a terrible movie. Um, Walter Scott was uh, more famous than Jane Austen in his day, which is ironic now since Austen is very famous and Scott is famous but never read. And there's a good reason for that. Walter Scott's books are very... They're historical, but they're really related to his history. He had to explain to... or kind of give people in England and Scotland a way to see themselves, make sense of their political situation, uh, which did not always admit of easy answers, and we'll get into that. And he did a very good job of it. The problem, though, is that once you are removed from that situation, the um, it, it doesn't make sense anymore. So what is it? Well, in the 1640s, England had a civil war. Oliver, Long story short, Oliver Cromwell... Uh, overthrew and beheaded King Charles I. And Charles' son, Charles II, was sent into exile, and upon or after Cromwell's death, Charles II came back from exile to uh, become king. Originally, the Presbyterians in Scotland, Covenanters, they supported Charles II because Charles agreed to uphold what is called the Solemn League and Covenant which uh, is a document saying that uh, England, Scotland, and Ireland are going to maintain the true faith, which conveniently is Presbyterianism. Um, Charles II agreed to support that. Of course, he had no intention of doing so. And it became clear whether you wanted to support that or not. It just was never going to happen. And as a result... Uh, not only did Charles II not support it, he uh, began persecuting the Presbyterians and uh, other nonconformists as well, which drove the more fanatical, and I don't use that word pejoratively, it drove the more fanatical out into the wilderness. And um, their religious meetings were outlawed. So that's sort of where our story starts. Uh, the hero of Old Mortality, his name is Henry Morton, and on one hand, he doesn't agree with the extreme fanaticism of the Covenanters, but on the other hand, he doesn't think they should be tortured either. And unfortunately, neither side uh, likes his compromise. And so that's kind of the background. Uh, the main characters in the in the book, and I'm not going to give you a summary of the whole story. The main characters in the book uh, is Henry Morton, the protagonist. The antagonist, it's kind of hard to decide. The in history, the antagonist would have been um, General Claverhouse, and he's not really the bad guy in this story. He. Uh, he is opposed to Henry Morton at times, but that's more for professional reasons than anything else. Henry Morton's love interest, her name is Edith. Edith is the granddaughter of Lady Margaret, and I forgot her last name at the moment. Anyway, and uh, Lady Margaret kind of reminds you of the and if you're in the South, you'll know this. You know the person in the South who tells all the stories about the Civil War when their great-grandfather, their great-great-grandfather. Well, 
that's Lady Margaret. She, uh, King Charles I, in hiding, had stopped by her castle, and so she always tells the story, and her servants have learned to see when this story's coming up, and they found ways to cut her off without offending her. And that's a problem, is that Lady Margaret and Edith are very high church Episcopalians, so that puts them at odds with the uh, Presbyterian protagonist. And so that's a problem, is that they're going to have to work through that. Another thing kind of to help you read this is you'll come across Whigs and Tories. A Whig, to oversimplify, believed in representative government, um, relative freedom of religion. And we'll get back to that. A Tory believed in throne and altar, monarchy, established church. Whigs would have been more open to a market economy. So freedom of religion is that while it appears the Covenanters are, be, are being persecuted for their beliefs, and they are, that does not mean if they were in charge they would grant freedom of religion to any other people. And that's kind of why Henry Morton is uh, loath to fully identify with their cause. So that's how the novel sets up. I'm going to leave it to you to read it if you're inclined. This is one of Scott's better novels. The problem with reading Scott is that it takes a long time to get into the novel. And by the end of the novel, Scott throws a lot of action at you. And if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss some important stuff. That being said, this really is a good novel. It's it, The story flows better. Other Scott stories, uh, you'll have different conspiracies and plots going on and it's not always relevant to the to the main plot which goes back to the movie Rob Roy they could take a subplot and make a movie about it and skip the main idea so uh, I encourage you to read it it's relatively easy to read there is a scotch dialect in it but if you read it out loud you can figure out what he's saying <laughs>